disturbing and too often overlooked crisis in care homes and a growing sense of unease over whether the lockdown measures can be eased or should be eased. Our topic for today, the state's positive obligations to protect its citizens in its various guises, could not be more timely. And I dare say we could not have found uh, a better group of people to discuss it than the wonderful panel that we have assembled for today. Before I introduce our speakers, who will each be speaking for 10 minutes, uh, I will just mention that if you would like to ask a question of our assembled panel, you can do so in the chat for this event at the end of the speaking part. Uh, if you'd like to engage with this event in social media, uh, you can do so with the hashtag HR versus COVID. And just a short note to also say that this event is being recorded and will be available to view afterwards. Now I'm going to introduce the panel uh, in order of their speaking. Uh, first up, we have Dr. Connell Mallory, who is a lecturer at the University of Newcastle and author of this recently published monograph on the extraterritorial application of human rights law. It's available in all good bookstores bookstores. Uh, so Dr. Mallory and I both specialize in the application of human rights law to terrible situations, and this certainly qualifies. Uh, he's going to be speaking on the positive obligations and personal protective equipment, especially from the standpoint of UK law. Next up, we have Professor Aoife Nolan, a professor of international human rights law at the University of Nottingham, a member of the European Committee of Social Rights, and Aoife is a leading expert in the field of economic, social, and cultural rights, in particular the rights of children. We're delighted that she can join us today, and she will be addressing the role of the European Social Charter during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next up, we have Professor Maris Amos, a professor of human rights law at Queen Mary University of London and a leading expert on the application of European Convention on Human Rights to UK law. She has recently published some very interesting analyses on how human rights law applies during the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK, and she will be addressing uh, how the positive obligations apply in the UK during lockdown. After that, we have Dr. Amanda Cahill Ripley, who is a senior lecturer in law at the University of Liverpool and specializes in economic, social and cultural rights, in particular, their application to different conflict situations. Dr. Cahill Ripley will be discussing the positive obligations arising under the right to health and under the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and the WHO's International Health Regulations. Finally, last but by no means least, we have Dr. Lawrence Laverson, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Ghent and erstwhile editor, co-editor of the ever interesting Strasbourg Observer blogs on European human rights law. Dr. Laverson is the author of Human Rights in a Positive State from Intersentia, and which includes a detailed analysis of positive obligations in the European Convention on Human Rights' case law. And Dr. Laverson will be discussing positive obligations in the context of leaving lockdowns. So without further ado, I will pass you over to our first speaker, Dr. Connell Mallory. Okay, um, thank you uh, very much, Constantine and Stuart, uh, for organizing this event. I found both of your, your earlier seminars superb, and I think, um, uh, yeah, I think that for, for, for once we're all finished with this, the, uh, uh, the resources that you're creating um, will, will, will certainly be used in, in teaching um, uh, uh, how we all talked about what happened when it happened. Um, so thanks, um, thanks for that. In my time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very, um, very narrow in my focus. I'm going to talk specifically about the shortages in personal protective equipment um, in the supply to frontline medical and care workers, uh, specifically in the United Kingdom, uh, although I fully appreciate that these uh, issues could be applied to other European states also. Um, let me begin by just setting out the context, and the context is, is pretty clear to anybody who's been following the news. The, from the earliest weeks of the virus spreading throughout Europe, uh, it became clear that there were concerns about the supply, delivery, and procurement of personal protective equipment to uh, frontline um, medical staff, as well as other groups. 
Um, in uh, the course of the past month, it became clear that these shortages were critical, um, with reports that doctors were resorting to um, surreal things. They were taping bin bags around their head in replacement for masks. They were purchasing swimming goggles because um, their visors were not being delivered. They were tying plastic aprons around their heads. Um, uh, and, and resorting to, to, uh, to wearing wholly um, inadequate equipment. The death toll in the United Kingdom for, um, uh, for uh, uh, NHS staff or care workers is, is, is fundamentally difficult for us to define. The Guardian are doing a study where they are do, um, reporting those that have been reported as well as those that they can identify as being reported through things like social media and family testimonies and they have the number at about 144. The reality is it's probably a lot higher. Uh, it's a lot higher because some of the deaths haven't been reported and it's a lot higher because, um, uh, uh, because um, we are only looking at a handful of different professions whenever there are other professions as well who may very well uh, have required personal protective equipment and not had it delivered to them. So what I want to do just over the course of the next, uh, next five, five or six minutes is talk about how Article 2 of the ECHR would apply to, uh, to this context. I'm going to do it across three phases uh, and look at it in, in step terms of, of, of increasing difficulty in application. But my ultimate conclusion is that I think that there is certainly an arguable case that the uh, Article 2 positive obligation uh, to protect life has been breached by the state. Um, but I, I won't do so without um, highlighting some of the, uh, the, the, the real difficulties that could be faced here. So the first phase is the simple question of could the provision of personal protective equipment fall within the scope of a state's obligation to protect life? And I think that is uh, uh, an absolute yes. Okay, the, the uh, right to life obligation uh, has a negative component and a positive component. We break the positive component down into three or four categories. I'll do it with three. First, the framework obligation to put in place uh, an effective uh, provisions and machinery to protect life. Second, an operational obligation to take preventative steps where the life of an identified individual is at risk. And then third, the procedural obligation to investigate where there's been an arguable breach. I've read commentary on this, I've written commentary myself, and my argument would probably be that we, we're looking at an operational obligation in this case, in that there is, uh, has been a failing by the government to take preventative operational measures to protect individuals whose lives are at risk. Um, we know from cases like uh, Honor Yulpes versus Turkey and more recently in Lopez uh, de Sousa Fernandez in Portugal that uh, this can apply in any context, in any activity, whether public or not, in which the right to life may be at stake. So it, it can have broad application, but as I will continue, we'll see that the application can become more and more narrow. The key question is whether the government knew or ought to have known of the dangers arising from exposure to, in this case, the, we're talking about the threat to life from the virus. And so we look at analogies like the McCann and UK case where the, the threat to life comes from a counter-terror operation or from uh, on our yield is itself where it's the inherent dangers for individuals living close to a, uh, a massive rubbish dump. Uh, Brinkhead and others versus Malta where we have um, uh, exposure to asbestos in the workplace. Uh, and we've seen in Lopez de Sousa Fernandez in Portugal uh, a very narrow application of the operational duty in respect of the healthcare context, although it, it is somewhat different to the, the situation we have in front of us. So, in summary, in response to my first question, could there be an obligation and could it fall within the scope? Yes, I certainly think so. Uh, COVID-19 is a lethal virus. There have been deaths of healthcare workers in China, Italy, Iran, Spain, and the United States before the first UK fatality came, um, uh, was, was reported um, from somebody on what, what the government referred to as the front line. Second, could uh, an interpretation of the right to life obligation and the positive obligation be either mitigated or removed or limited by, um, uh, by, by looking at, at, at the, uh, um, uh, at the uh, reasonableness of applying the interpretation. Uh, the ECHR is being clear, the positive obligation is not open-ended, it must be judged reasonably and applied in a manner which does not impose an impossible or disproportionate burden on the state. And uh, simply we've seen uh, before and um, that this is where some 
positive obligation arguments will flounder where they will run aground. Um, it certainly will pose challenges to any cases being brought forward in this. Uh, one of the questions that you could, uh, on this basis, one of the questions you could ask is, does the obligation to extend to all state employed healthcare workers or all healthcare workers in, in, in general? And that may give rise to serious issues of, uh, of whether it's uh, reasonable or, uh, or possible. But there are certain counter arguments given what we already know about the pandemic. We know that on repeated occasions, the UK government has said that a pandemic is one of the principal threats to the United Kingdom. And so it has been uh, ostensibly, or at least reportedly, stockpiling PPE. We know that the um, uh, looking at, at, at the proportionality aspect, if we're balancing the right to life of an individual healthcare worker, what are we balancing it against? Are we looking at a national interest? And in that case, the, the national interest is, is certainly that the right to life of the healthcare worker is, is, given, um, is given a significant amount of, uh, of weight, uh, given that the two issues really go hand in hand. We need our healthcare workers in order to, uh, for, the, uh, for the nation to overcome the, the current crisis. So, on the face of things, there's a potential that the PPE shortages could give rise to a violation of the positive obligation. Now, the third thing, the third aspect of this is, is what Stuart has referred to as this, this view of terrible situations, okay? This, this idea that, um, uh, that in particular context, we may be looking at a different application of the right. So the third thing I'll ask is whether the discretion, uh, deference, margin of appreciation, issues of justiciability are going to make it more difficult for a case on the right to life to succeed in relation to PPE. Um, uh, the ECHR uh, alluded to as much in uh, Stoyanovi versus Bulgaria. This is a case involving uh, the death of a, um, a, a soldier during a military parachute training operation. And the court indicated that a different standard could apply in what they described as inherently dangerous situations, so situations which posed inherent danger. Um, where these situations uh, arose, they were different to the normal dangerous situation in that the individual was routinely involved in an activity which could potentially cause them harm. Now, uh, where such dangerous activities arise, the ECHR has said that the uh, obligation is, is reduced to a reasonable minimum and that uh, it, a state would be found in breach if, they, if there were insufficient regulations or insufficient control. Now, I'm not particularly happy taking this line specifically with, uh, with medical care workers in that there's an entirely different relationship between them and their, uh, their employers. Um, they don't sign up to put themselves uh, into risk. They don't uh, identify themselves to go into harm's way. But given that there is some jurisprudence on this uh, at the ECHR, and in particular in the UK in relation to equipment failings for soldiers, I think it's something that we need to be cognizant of if these cases are going to go forward. In the UK context, context the most analogous case that we could look at is the provision of equipment to soldiers during the Iraq war. And in this context, uh, the case that is probably most relevant is Smith versus Ministry of Defence. Now in Smith, the question was whether or not the provision of Snatch Land Rovers, uh, a lightly armoured vehicle, um, put soldiers at undue risk uh, during uh, combat situations. Uh, and at the Supreme Court, Lord Hope uh, proposed a test, and the test essentially said um, that the courts would not stray to look at where feelings were of government policy, or where feelings were on the ground and were related to the individual decisions on the battlefield. Uh, he created this middle ground then where a uh, right to life positive obligation case would have to be made. Uh, and my contention would be that, that that argument could still be made in respect of feelings in relation to PPE. The reason for that is that some of the feelings you don't have to even link to decisions of government lethargy in regards to uh, purchasing equipment. And you don't have to point to where there have been particular accusations of hospital mismanagement. The failures in stockpiling prior to the uh, pandemic could be one. Uh, a second could be the fact that the government is in full control of the, uh, uh, of the supply chain. Uh, it's built that, uh, or it's, it's in control of aspects of the supply chain, which it's built from scratch. And there, uh, there are uh, considerable difficulties with the delivery of the equipment. And the third is in respect of how the COVID-19 virus has been downgraded uh, at the initial outbreak, which meant that the um, uh, particular healthcare workers didn't have to wear personal protective equipment. 
Now I'm conscious of time, so I'll summarize and I'll say this. I've taken us through three steps, and at each step, it gets more difficult to make the case for a positive obligation on the right to life. And yet I think even at the most difficult uh, application where you afford um, uh, discretion to the state, I think that an arguable case can be made. And because that arguable case can be made, I think that this, the, the, the complement, uh, complementary obligation of a procedural obligation to investigate deaths is absolutely certain that the, the, the cases can be brought forward on that basis. And this is where, where much of the attention needs to be focused as we go forward into how it's going to, uh, how it's going to be manifested. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave my comments there and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Connell, for those uh, comments. Uh, I'll just switch off the spotlight there and we're back on camera. Okay, um, so uh, if we can switch over to uh, Aoife, I will just pass you over there um, for her comments, which would be on the uh, Economic Social uh, Rights Committee. Over to you, Aoife. Okay, um, thank you first of all, uh, thank you very much to Stuart and Constantine for having organised this and thank you very much to Connell for a very, uh, for a great, a great kick off of the event. Now, my focus in my, uh, in my presentation is the other European human rights uh, instrument, specifically the European Social Charter. And I can see a number of faces kind of smiling in a half embarrassed, half kind of fond way as I mention the European Social Charter. And it's a huge cliche at this point to say that, you know, it's not the social charter is described as a sister instrument to the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. But in fact, if we look at it in practice, and particularly if we look at, at it in terms of European uh, human rights law academic uh, research or European human rights law teaching, it is better to describe it as the long forgotten distant cousin who rocks up to a family wedding and no one knows who the hell they are and what they're doing there. OK, so harsh words, but I think it's important to acknowledge the particularly, you know, the actual position um, that the social charter has is, is considered to have. And um, not just by government sometimes, but also in the way in which we speak about human rights law uh, in in Europe and also in the way in which we teach it. So you will see I will return to that point at the end. So in my presentation today, I want to focus on three key areas. Uh, first of all, I'm, you know, I'm not going to provide a detailed overview of the European Social Charter. I have prepared a lovely document that Constantine and Stuart will uh, circulate later, which will hopefully help cover some of the gaps in terms of what I'm saying. But I, I am going to start by giving a brief overview of uh, you know, a brief overview of the Charter. I'm then going to talk about the wide range of rights under the Charter that are relevant at this time of COVID-19, and indeed are, were relevant before COVID-19 and will be grimly relevant after COVID-19. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about then is to hone in on Article 11, which is uh, a provision of both the original Charter of 1961 and the revised Charter of 1996, it's the same, same text in both, so there's no problem there, but it's on the right to protection of health. And that, that right obviously has particular uh, importance in the current context. Finally, I'm going to uh, kind of come back to the comments that I've just made and talk a little bit about why I think it's really important um, that academics, practitioner, practitioners and others working, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, in the context of this health crisis, uh, I suppose, up, up our game with regards to the European Social Charter. Now, I'm now going to, forgive me, try to share my screen. There we go. Right. Has that, has, no, that, has that worked? Right. Yes. Okay. Sorry, okay, I can't actually pick it up at the moment. May I send it to you, Constantine, and get you to share it? Would that be okay, rather than wasting people's time with it? So um, I think the key thing, though, is to flag that there are a very wide range of provisions under, under the uh, social charter um, that we need to bear in mind. Uh, let me just send this now, excuse me, and then it's done. Uh, 
And the first is Article 3, the right of all workers to uh, safe and healthy working conditions. Uh, I think we can agree that in light of particularly of situations around uh, not just PPE, which Connell has uh, spoken about so effectively, but also this question of people going back to work after lockdown in positions where social distancing is impossible um, and indeed maybe undesirable in terms of the job being done. That's obviously a relevant issue. Um, we have Article 7, uh, the right of uh, persons, uh, the right of children and young persons to special protection from physical and moral hazards. Uh, and immediately that will make us think of uh, not necessarily the, the risks that are posed, health risks that are posed by um, that are posed by COVID-19, but they might, it certainly uh, will drive us towards some of the stories that we've seen here in the UK and elsewhere about the risks that children and others face in the domestic violence or abuse context during the lockdown situation. So it's interesting. That's the first example that I'll speak about today where the social charter, while being a social rights instrument, very much, very much indirectly affords protection to civil and political rights too, or rights that we've tended to think of as being civil and political. Um, Article 8 provides, uh, and this provides uh, special protection to pregnant women, uh, employed women in the case of maternity. We just have to think about nurses and other medics who've apparently felt under pressure to go into work during this health crisis while pregnant, despite the fact that there appears to be a particular vulnerability or a possibility of a vulnerability linked to pregnancy, late stage pregnancy, and COVID-19 susceptibility and impact. Um, Article 12. Um, workers and their dependents have the right to social security. Okay, we have masks, we're seeing mass closures, we're seeing furlough, we're seeing people being told to go and look for ESA, universal credit. Uh, huge dependence on the parts of workers and their families and the social security system. And questions have to be asked whether social security systems are in fact up to the job, uh, given what they're being required to do in this new normal. Article 13, moving away from the notion of social security linked to work, but then this concept of the right to social, uh, the right to social or medical assistance, which is very much, uh, which is this notion that anyone without adequate resources has the right to social and medical assistance. And I mean, this is, again, if we, I, I'm, I'm putting up examples from the UK because I think that's where the vast majority of those um, who are listening to this session are based. Um, but if we think about the position with regards to, um, if we think about the position with regards to family, um, family, families with children who suddenly have children at home, it is proved, it is demonstrating, and we see the work of civil society organisations flagging that having children at home has massively increased pressures on household income. You know, are and we're not seeing in different countries, we're not seeing social systems, social assistance systems responding to that very effectively. We're seeing high levels of hunger as a result and other forms of deprivation. Article 16, the right to social, legal and economic protection of families. I want you to think about lockdown and inadequate housing for families. Um, domestic violence is something we look at. Um, fam the level of family allowances. As you can see, it's a wide ranging provision and the impacts of COVID-19 are, wi COVID are also wide ranging. So it's useful to have a provision that allows us to engage with COVID-19 through you know, a multifaceted lens. Um, it's, the la it's the previous slide actually, Const Constantine, if you can move up, if that's okay. Yeah, 17 is the final one I want to mention here, and that's the right to social, legal, and economic protection of children, right? School closures, right to play, you know, in Spain you can walk your dog, but you can't walk your child, or you could, sorry, you can now, but you couldn't. Um, ho increases in child hunger uh, across, you know, in, in a significant number of countries in Europe. We are seeing a huge range of the rights under the Charter. Charter, And these rights are in both the 61 Charter and the revised Charter of 96, being impacted on by COVID-19, but also state responses to COVID-19. I think it's also worth mentioning, given where we are, that the revised Charter also includes specific provisions on the rights of the elderly, which we don't see in other international or regional human rights systems to the same degree, within the European context anyway, and of course the rights of persons with disabilities. And both of those groups are significantly impacted, not just by their apparent 
increased vulnerability to COVID-19, but also the fact that these groups seem set to be more heavily impacted upon in terms of further steps to be taken post lockdown in many states. We're talking about cocooning of the over 70s, cocooning of those with particular health situations. Okay, so that's just some of the ways in which we see the charter engaging. And I think just before I finish and move on to the right to health, protection of health, I think it's really important that we note that COVID-19 and its impacts on particular groups, its particularly severe impacts on groups, obviously didn't come out of nowhere. Okay, And what we're seeing with COVID-19, as we do with any crisis, economic, financial, health, whatever, is that it's laying bare and it's exacerbating pre-existing structural inequalities and societal vulnerabilities. And so it's not clear that the committee on which I am in our recent statement of interpretation, which I'll speak about in a minute, has emphasized the role of historic and ongoing shortcomings in state efforts to secure charter rights that have fed directly into the vulnerability of particular groups in, in, a, in a pandemic, right? So for instance, failures to secure, uh, failures to ensure, to end, to bring homelessness to an end, to provide adequate housing um, and the right, to, or state failures with regards to giving effect to the right to ensure freedom from poverty, protection from poverty and social, social exclusion. Okay, so it's, it's, this isn't something that just looks at the tip, it doesn't just look at the deaths or the tail end, the impacts of COVID-19 after the fact. It will also require, if we look at COVID-19 from a charter perspective, looking backwards at the underpinning issues that have led to the impact, led to COVID-19 and state responses to COVID-19 having the impact they've had. Okay, and it, you know, it sounds like, ro it isn't rocket science, but it is very important. Uh, very important. I now want to very quickly turn to talk about the right to protection of health. So that is the next slide, please, Constantine. See if you can, and you can see her here, right? This is in both charters. It's been accepted um, by all of the 43 members that are, 43 of the 47 Council of Europe members that are states parties to the charter, except for Armenia alone, gloriously alone in this case. And you can see that it has a number of key elements that are obviously relevant, right? So I'm not going to read it out to you. You have it in front of you, but look at subparagraph one, state obligation, state undertakings to take measures to remove as far as possible the causes of ill health, to provide advisory and educational facilities for the promotion of health. So public education, public awareness, etc. And third, to prevent as far as, far as possible epidemic, endemic, and other diseases as well as accidents, right? So. Article 2 ECHR, it certainly isn't. Okay, there's a wide range of very, you know, relatively specific obligations on states set out there. And it's not surprising, given that we are where we are, that this has been the key, this provision was the key focus of the first major statement of the Committee um, of the European Committee of Social Rights following uh, COVID-19. And there was quite a bit of discussion within, the, as you can imagine, about how the Committee should respond you will see that the vast majority of UN committees and other regional bodies have issued press statements, guidance, statements, press releases, this is the language. And ultimately what the European Committee of Social Rights did was come up with a statement of interpretation. And this is effectively a soft law statement, which is the equivalent for those of us who work in the UN system of a general comment. But it means that it's not just meant to be a general guidance or statement, it's actually meant to provide direct guidance on state implementation when it comes to the right to protection of health. Okay, so key elements of it. Um, you know, I will say I, the link is on the, will, is on, will be on the slide, the final slide. Don't bother changing it to it now, though. Key thing is that the right to protection of health is given the highest priority in policies, laws and other actions. States have to take all the necessary emergency measures in a pandemic, including measures to prevent and limit the spread of the virus. The statement talks explicitly about testing and tracing, physical distancing, self-isolation, the provision of PPE, as well as the imposition of quarantine and lockdown arrangements. Okay, and it says that all such measures must be designed and implemented having regard to the current state of scientific knowledge and in accordance with relevant human rights standards. Okay, so it's a very strong, detailed set, uh, you know, to the extent that these things ever are at the international level, detailed set of, um, detailed statement, uh, outline of undertakings. 
there is references to the need to take all necessary measures to treat those who fall ill in the pandemic. Um, to do this, you have to ensure the availability of a sufficient number of hospital beds, ICUs, equipment, and there has to be an adequate number of healthcare professionals deployed and steps have to be taken to ensure that their working conditions are healthy and safe. Again, so building on what Connell has said, but also very much I know what will be talked about later on. Clear, big emphasis on public awareness, education, people need to know about, be told about the risks of contagion, how to mitigate them and how to access healthcare services. Um, crucially, um, states have to be aware of the mindful of the impact that their choices will have for groups with heightened vulnerabilities as well as for other people affected so it's not a case of one size fits all states have to build this in from the very beginning in their responses they have to build in this reflection of the position of vulnerable groups and um, the right to protection of health includes right of access to health care it has to be affordable it has to health care has to be affordable it has access has to be effective and it has to be available without discrimination. Okay, and there are lots of groups in different parts of Europe that have not had equal access to healthcare, even where it's been available. And I think we can come back to this perhaps when we think about systems where we see very high levels of privatization or reliance upon health insurance, private health insurance. Um, finally, and there's a lot more in there, but I just want to emphasize that under 11.3, this reference to epidemic diseases, the committee makes clear that states parties have to operate widely accessible immunization programs and maintain high coverage rates. And consistently throughout the statement, there's a linkage with WHO guide, guidance, right? So there isn't an effort by the European Committee to set itself up as public health experts, number one. It's about just where appropriate there is defer you know deference to the bodies that do know now i'm conscious that and i am going to wrap it up because i've i've spoken over my time but i, I just want to finish here and I, I want to finish by saying that i think it's very important i want to come back to my first comment and after the financial and economic crisis human rights academics include you know got a lot of flack Partic including in Europe, particularly in Europe, where we were at the, the front line, headline wise, of the financial and economic crises, for really enga engaging head on with the causes and impacts of those crises. Okay. And, the, and I think that part of that, at least, is due to our focus um, and very heavy focus, almost to the exclusion of everything else, on the European Convention on Human Rights. Okay. And my aim isn't to do down. The work, work on the ECHR or the work people are doing on it, right? And real, reaching for the European Convention for COVID-19 in Europe, of course it makes sense, right? Not least because of the status of the convention, the institutional legitimacy and the influence of the ECHR system, the quality of case law from the European court and domestic courts, right? I am not suggesting any of that is not true, okay? However, regardless of that, the fact is that by solely focusing on the European Convention, European human rights lawyers risk failing again those whose rights are most severely impacted by the social, economic, health, educational, all the other impacts of the current crisis. Okay, and ultimately, we need to engage with the European Social Charter because it is, I would argue, in the current context, very much in human rights instrument terms, the, you know, the right tool for the job in hand. I'll leave it there. Excellent. Thank you very much for your welcome comments there, Aoife, and for um, uh, emphasizing the role that um, the economic, social, and cultural rights should possibly be playing in this um, crisis and in this pandemic. Over to uh, you next, um, uh, Maris Amos. Uh, if, if you'd like to um, begin your comments there, I'll just pass over the floor to you. I think I'm, yeah, great. All right, thank you. And thank you very much for um, inviting me. And I'm following on from Aoife, I'm gonna have to apologize for talking about the ECHR. Um, that is my area of expertise, more specifically the Human Rights Act, which is the UK's way of giving effect to the ECHR in national law. 
And um, I do know about the importance of economic, social, and cultural rights, and I have written about that. Um, but I do like to see the fear on the face of government ministers when they think that a court might find them liable for a breach of the Human Rights Act, which unfortunately, we can't achieve the same with the Charter at the moment. But who knows what's going to happen in our, in our post-virus world. So positive duties and ECHR, there are so many positive duties arising at the moment, it's very hard to keep track, um, but it remains very, very important. So Connell did me a favor and has um, already given you uh, a good rundown of what positive obligations mean in this context. And so there are so many in play that I've, I found one way of organizing thoughts about the positive obligations triggered by the pandemic is to think about the different groups who could benefit or possibly benefit from the state acting to protect rights. And at the moment, that's, that's best illustrated by Article 2, as Connell was talking about, that, that Osman duty set out in 1997. So I was thinking and there's, there's about five different groups I can think of at the moment. And the first group is obviously everyone. And we had our lockdown in the UK came into force on the 26th of March. And it, it has an enormous impact on an enormous number of people. But there is this real and immediate risk to life from the virus, uh, from the NHS being overwhelmed. There's knowledge of that on the part of the state and the lockdown for now, we could say is a reasonable measure put in place to avoid that risk. The second group are those in the care of the state. And so they might be in hospital, they might be in prison, they might be in immigration detention, they might be in a host hostel for homeless people. And of course, they could be in a care home. And here, this positive duty to protect life is even more important because the state has assumed responsibility for health and safety and, and the exercise and control. And so this duty is incredibly important and these people are particularly vulnerable. The third group, as, as Connell's talked about, is NHS staff providing medical treatment. The fourth group is those frontline service providers those who are still going to work, the bus drivers, the refuse collectors, those keeping the parks open, those um, operating public transport, those working in care homes. And so again, the state is under a duty to provide uh, personal protective equipment. And the fifth and final group is, is those actually suffering from the virus. And, and here the, the state has a duty to treat them when treatment is in the patient's best interests. So there's, there's all these positive duties and that's just the right to life. And we can see how a positive duty arises in relation to each of those groups. But it is not that simple and it is not straightforward. And when we think about positive duties, it, there's lots of different problems arise. So first of all, the groups are not fixed. These five groups I've set out are very broad and already I imagine some of you are questioning that. Um, so if we think about everyone, should we think that the over 70s require more protection? Should those living in deprived parts of the UK require more protection? Those with asthma, um, those from the, the black minority ethnic community, or should we have less protection for people who can prove they've had the virus and possibly have some immunity? Um, second, as, as time goes by, this question of what is reasonable and a reasonable response from the state to this risk to life also changes. And so many are now questioning the reasonableness of the lockdown as such a blunt instrument for protecting life. And you may have seen that there's currently an attempt to crowdfund a legal challenge to the lockdown, although what I've seen from the, the pre-action protocol letter, the, the respect for life, the care for life in that, that letter is, is fairly lacking. Um, could it be argued now that it's the time for testing and contact tracing and some restriction on movement, which is a more reasonable response than what is currently in, in place? And I'm sure Lawrence will be talking more about that later. The third problem that arises, and I'll spend a little bit more time on this, is that these, these right to life duties, these positive duties, also conflict with other positive duties and have the potential in themselves to dis disproportionately impact 
on, on particular groups. So in some instances, a right to life positive duty might conflict with another, such as the duty to treat a, a COVID patient where the, where the NHS staff member does not even have pr appropriate protective equipment. And it's one, just one example, but as the lockdown goes on, there are lots of other examples arising. And the first that I, I really have to mention is, is domestic violence. And in common with lots of other countries, uh, the UK, there has been reports of a massive increase in domestic violence affecting but predominantly women and children. So refuge, the, the UK's, sorry, that's the dog. I'm really sorry about that. Um, the UK's largest charity supporting women and children has reported a massive increase in uh, reports to its abuse helpline. There's a, a been uh, numerous reports of an increase in deaths uh, since the lockdown commenced. Refuges for abuse victims are reporting they're running out of space. And so the states under this other positive duty under Article 3 and also under Article 2 to protect against that, to protect against violence and to protect against uh, risk to life. The second conflict arising is this message to stay home and save lives continues. But there are those who are taking this message very, very seriously and, and also coupled with the fear that they might catch the virus at hospital. So they're not seeking the vital medical treatment or taking sufficient steps to stave off serious damage to their mental health or to get this, this really important medical treatment that they might need. Um, it's been reported that there's a sharp increase in the number of people dying at home because they're reluctant to call for an ambulance. And, and then also this, this parallel story that treatments have been cancelled and it was reported in late April that, that COVID could actually lead to 18,000 more cancer deaths. Thirdly, for most, lockdown is necessary and proportionate and, and we'll get by given the number of lives at stake. But as with all blanket interferences with rights, there are those for whom it's not proportionate. And given their personal circumstances, some are suffering from a really terrible disproportionate negative impact. So it's possible for them to argue that the, the balance is, is incorrect with them alternatively to, to say that there is a Article 14 discrimination problem. So the last question I want to consider is, is remedies. So what if the state is not fulfilling its positive duties? How should the clashes between rights be resolved? One point it's important to note, in some instances, these rights infringements involve not only the state, but the private sector, and as is the position in, in private care homes. So it, it may not be possible to, um, to think about uh, the, the, the same obligations that we think about as positive duties in, in relation to the state, in relation to whether the violation is actually stemming from a private provider. But within the, the state duties, the, um, the difficult um, issues, uh, some have been partially resolved. And we would hope that the, the state would, would do that to um, without being asked, without litigation. So some things have been resolved partially already. Um, being able to leave the house to escape injury is, is part of the government's guidance. Um, and the government has also launched a campaign to help victims of domestic abuse. Uh, at home shouldn't mean at risk. And it's provided specific guidance on support for victims of domestic abuse. But it's, it's argued that much more is required, and ensuring uh, adequate funding to make sure that charities supporting victims are able to continue their work. Uh, with respect to the disproportionate impact of the lockdown, some successful arguments have already been made. Um, government guidance amended without the need for court proceedings. So, so following pre-action correspondence, the government confirmed it amended the guidance to make it clear that those with health conditions that required them to leave their homes more than once a day and travel beyond their local area uh, were expressly permitted to do so. And the claim seeking that clarification had been brought by two families with children with autism spectrum disorder whose conditions made it necessary for them to leave the house more than once a day for their own well-being. 
There's also been a campaign about the importance of seeking medical treatment and a promise about the provision of laptops and Wi-Fi for disadvantaged peoples in England. There are a few inquiries going on at the moment. Uh, NHS England is leading an inquiry into why BME and staff are disproportionately affected. Uh, Berkshire NHS Trust has begun a serious incident investigation into the death of a particular doctor who raised the alarm about absence of PPE. Uh, Public Health England has just announced uh, a review of which factors affect vulnerability to the virus. There has been uh, litigation, you've, you've probably read about. Litigation has started but not been concluded um, over the framework duty to protect life um, concerning uh, do not resuscitate orders and also over the prioritization of treatment. There's been litigation about PPE and about the failure to provide emergency funding for adequate accommodation for domestic abuse survivors surviving the crisis. But I should say that apart from that, there are serious ongoing problems with the state's duty to fulfill its human rights obligation. We are, we are witnessing a nightmare of deaths in care homes, enormous problems as Connor was talking about with PPE and, and numerous failures to get widespread testing off the ground. And, and, and as was mentioned earlier by Aoife, as these plans to ease lockdown are beginning to be discussed, it's causing workers and their unions to fear that their lives are going to be at risk if they're forced to return to unsafe workspaces. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm just finishing up now because I think I, my time is, has elapsed, but it's very useful to see these as human rights problems. Um, and I agree with Aoife entirely that there's also this incredibly important economic social rights side to the, to the question as well. Um, but I, I'm also seeing them as human rights law problems and human rights act problems is unfortunately getting attention and it's getting more attention from government than might otherwise be the case. And I, I see this, this prospect for them of legal accountability is, is very motivating. Um, so for all of those who have been writing about the, the potential accountability um, for what is happening, I, I, I would encourage you to continue to do so on, on all fronts. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Amos, and, and thank you also for the interjections of your dog, which were uh, echoing your, your sentiments and, and boosting your, your, your speech there um, in an entertaining way. <laughs> um, so over to Amanda next, who will be uh, talking about economic, social and cultural rights. Amanda, um, if you'd uh, like to take the floor, please. Thank you, Stuart, and um, thank you to Constantine as well for inviting me to participate in this um, webinar and, and this initiative. And thanks to all the speakers so far for their insights from various perspectives. Um, so uh, coming back to economic, social and cultural rights, I'm going to look at uh, positive state obligations and COVID-19 from the perspective of the right to health. Um, but I'm going to look at the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, as you would expect. But also, I wanted to look at the World Health Organization's um, international health regulations. And if I can follow up on Aoife's um, uh, metaphors, if the European Social Charter is the distant cousin of uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, then I think perhaps the international health regulations is some poor lost relative to the right to health. Um, there is, seems to be very little coordination and cooperation and discussion between global health lawyers and uh, economic and social rights lawyers. And I think this is something that um, uh, needs to be picked up but in terms of a comprehensive approach to protecting the right to health, particularly obviously in the time of a public health emergency. So I'm gonna start by looking um, at the uh, Covenant on Economic and Social Rights. Then I'll move on to, and I'll, and I'll pull out a couple of significant obligations. I think they're particularly around international assistance and cooperation. Uh, then I'll move on to look at the WHO international health regulations. And, and the idea is to look at the protection of the right to health um, from an individual perspective, but also to look at the collective aspects of a right to public health. 
Okay. So um, for those of us that, that work on economic and social rights, we know that under the Covenant, Article 12 provides for a right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. And part of the steps to be taken that are set out in paragraph two of that provision is the prevention, treatment and control of epidemic, endemic, occupational and other diseases. And for those that, that don't know, the general comment 14 of 2000 by the Committee on Economic and Social Rights provides what we call the triple AQ framework, which sets out the essential elements of the right to health. And again, I'm just going to focus on the UK because of time um, today. But if we look at the UK government's response so far to the COVID-19 pandemic against this normative content, we can see already a number of issues with the enjoyment of this right. So, for example, availability of the right to health provides that health facilities, goods and services are available in sufficient quantity. And immediately what springs to right mind is obviously picking up on the PPE issue, the testing issues that we've all um, seen uh, uh, documented um, and heard about and been discussing. In terms of accessibility, facilities, goods and services should be available to everyone without discrimination. And again, straight away we can look at the plight of those in social care, not just the elderly, but others in social care, prisoners, um, many vulnerable groups. Um, acceptability is another uh, element of the normative content framework, but also quality. And again, we can pick up here on uh, PPE um, and testing. So it, it provides that facilities, goods and services should be scientifically appropriate and of good quality. So we can see already the issues arising uh, in, in the response so far. In terms of the state's positive obligations, the uh, general comment also sets out the obligation to protect, which of course includes the state's positive obligation to protect against interference from third parties, whether that be through adoption of legislation or taking other measures to ensure equal access to healthcare and health related services provided by third parties. Also to ensure that privatization of the health sector does not constitute a threat to uh, the framework for health and the enjoyment of the right to health. And again, of course, this is really important in light of the fact of the public private partnerships that we're seeing to combine resources to deliver the most effective possible response to the pandemic within the United Kingdom. So we've seen, for example, in the UK government contracting private healthcare providers to work at cost and without profit to bolster the state's capacity to combat COVID-19. It's also really important in light of the fact of the privatisation of the social care sector within the United Kingdom. So the obligation to protect provides that states must ensure these partnerships are not detrimental to the enjoyment of the right to health. But I also wanted to look at the broader obligation to protect from hazards and threats to human rights in a general sense. So um, I'll come back to that when we look at the World Health Organization, but also to say that as well as the obligation to protect, we need the obligation to fulfill, um, the positive obligation to facilitate and um, provide on the part of states to ensure provision of healthcare, and that includes immunisation programmes against major infectious diseases. Okay. Another positive obligation that I wanted to highlight, which I think is really significant, is the obligation for international cooperation and assistance. Now, Article 2 of the uh, Covenant on Economic and Social Rights sets out the obligations of all states to take steps individually and through international assistance and cooperation, especially economic and technical, towards the full realisation of the rights in the covenant, including the right to health. And this is particularly important given the gross inequalities in the health status of people between developed and developing countries, as well as within countries. And again, these stark inequalities 
have been really highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic and the responses or the, the lack of response. And I want to second um, Aoife's comments earlier on that just to highlight that these structural inequalities and the persistent lack of investment in health, so health systems is become glaringly apparent um, to, to, to everybody um, in, in the light of the pandemic. And the recent statement by the Committee on Economic and Social Rights on COVID-19, they pointed out that healthcare systems and social programmes have been weakened by decades of underinvestment in public health services and other social programmes and accelerated by the global financial crisis of 2007-2008. And the consequences of that is that many countries are ill-equipped to respond effectively to cope with the intensity of this current pandemic. And it's in this context that we see that the obligation of international assistance and cooperation is absolutely crucial in tackling the pandemic. And again, the committee note that it requires even stronger commitments to international cooperation, including working through agencies such as the World Health Organization. Okay. Of course, Core obligations are very important. Um, the general comment 14 sets out minimum core obligations and obligations of comparable priority. Um, and these are important, of course, because they're not subject to limitations. So that includes providing immunization against major infectious diseases occurring in the community and to take measures to prevent, treat and control epidemic diseases. So core obligations need to be prioritised. I'm just looking at time. I just briefly mention the obligation um, of non-discrimination and special protections because I'm, I'm conscious of time. And again, I can pick up on some of the points Eva made earlier about um, you know, human rights normative strength is this uh, provision and framework for dealing with them uh, and protecting the most vulnerable. And again, we see this outlined um, in the right to health, the immediate obligation to guarantee that the right to health is exercised without discrimination of any kind. Even in time of severe resource constraints, the vulnerable must be protected. So um, um, I was going to talk about uh, the obligation to protect older persons, but we, um, I'll move on quickly. But if we can come back to that in the questions if, if people want to. Okay, so moving on to global health law. Now, the international health regulations are the key global instrument that provides universal protection against the international spread of disease. If you look at the international health regulations, there are only three explicit mentions of human rights, but human rights are um, included as a normative principle underpinning the regulations. The impl implementation of the regulations says shall be guided by the constitution of the World Health Organization, which of course affirms the enjoyment of the highest attainable uh, standard of health within its preamble. Now the World Health Organization have also stated that the right to health is at the heart of their response to COVID-19. They say our commitment to health as a human right must continue as a beacon for how countries respond to this and other public health emergencies. It's also true that there are similarities between um, the positive state obligations uh, under the convention and under the international health regulations. So state parties have positive obligations to protect public health by developing certain minimum core public health capacities. They have uh, an obligation to protect and provide for the population's health through various provisions. For example, Article 5 deals with surveillance and Article 13 deals with preparedness and capacity for public health responses. What's also interesting is the international health regulations contain obligations for international cooperation and assistance. So, for example, the preamble urges member states to collaborate actively with each other and the WHO in accordance with the provisions of the IHR so as to ensure their effective implementation, to provide support to, to developing countries and 
countries with economies in transition. So um, we can see again the mirroring of these obligations, albeit on a collective basis in the international health regulations. So the value added of looking at the IHR, I think, is that it fills the gap of individual of an individual human rights approach and adds to it with a collective aspect of the right to health. But there are some problems. The WHO um, lack both power and the mechanisms to monitor and implement the IHR. At the moment, the monitoring of the international health regulations consists of a mandatory annual self-assessment of capacity. There's no compliance committee, there's no review by an expert body, there's no recommendations, and that the self-assessment is quantitative data only. Another limitation, of course, is its institutional limitations, and we've seen this in, in this current pandemic with the USA in particular um, pulling out their funding. And of course, only 20% of the WHO's funding is actually core compulsory funding. The other 80% is voluntary and comes from many different, um, many different uh, parties, including many non-state actors. So to conclude then, I think I've gone over a little bit. Um, I think it's safe to say that the UK is, has breached its positive obligations to protect and fulfill the right to health and related rights. I think also to protect the most vulnerable under international human rights law. But I also think there's a failure to comply with positive obligations to protect the health of the population in terms of insufficient preparedness and surveillance under the international health regulations and a failure to act in a timely manner. So there's been both individual violations of the right to health and breach of the collective right to public health. And my final point then is, how do we respond? Of course, we know we need to encourage domestic implementation um, of economic, social and cultural rights and advocate for advocacy to incorporate them into domestic law. And I'm sure we'll see um, special procedures continuing to issue guidance at, at the UN level and remedies coming through the state reporting system and the treaty bodies in time. And of course, the regional mechanisms and I'll take the opportunity to commend the committee on the statement of interpretation, which I think is wonderful. But it's also a question, I think, of this diversity in approaches to dealing with global health that's problematic. So I think we need to see much greater collaboration and engagement between global health lawyers and international human rights lawyers. The WHO has a very technical public health focus, and I think that more expertise in human rights is needed. But we also need to see institutional reform of the WHO um, in terms of their monitoring and implementation powers and in terms of reforming the financing model. The final point that I want to make is that we need to acknowledge the role of private actors in all of this. We need to look at them as providers of healthcare goods and services, for example, social care providers. Um, we need to look at them in terms of global health, in terms of vaccine development. So we need to explore much more, I think, the human rights obligations of non-state actors, but also um, how the state obligation to protect um, plays into the um, protection from non-state actors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amanda, for those welcome comments. Uh, just to finish off then, I will go straight over to Lawrence because we are actually getting quite a lot of questions that we'll need to get through afterwards. So um, I'll go straight over to you, Lawrence, uh, to get your comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Stuart. Um, so in my presentation, I want to reflect on the question what positive obligations under the ECHR can teach us regarding what measures governments ought to take to protect their population against the COVID-19 outbreak, um, including what it can teach us regarding how to organize it, the exit from the lockdown. I will focus mainly on Article 2, the right to life, as interpreted by the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and I can already tell you that my answer uh, will be, I don't think it can teach us a lot, I'm afraid. Um, but let me please explain myself. Um, so when talking about positive obligations under Article 2, we, we, we immediately tend to think of cases like Osman v. the UK, 
which requires authorities to take reasonable measures to protect individuals against real and immediate risks uh, to their lives posed by the criminal acts of a third party. However, um, this case law is not extremely useful in this context uh, since it presupposes an individualized risk. Well, here we're talking about a diffuse risk to the life of the population at large. Um, regarding such more diffuse risks, there is some limited case law that focuses on the question of the general protection of the right to life. Um, think, for instance, of, of the case of Una Yildiz, uh, that has already been mentioned before, in which the court has required safeguards to be in place in order uh, to restrict or uh, to monitor risks that uh, stem from uh, industrial activities. I'm only aware of one case of this type that concerns threats to life uh, that stem from nature rather than from human activities. And that's the case of Bidayeva versus Russia uh, regarding uh, a number of deadly landslides that had hit a Russian town. In this case, uh, the court ruled that the government should have taken measures to warn the inhabitants for such a foreseeable risk of landslides and to prepare for evacuation if necessary. I'd say that clearly COVID-19 poses a general threat to the right to life that in principle at an abstract level gives rise to a general positive obligation on the government to protect the population against the outbreak. However, um, more difficult to determine is what kind of concrete measures are required from states under Article 2. And the problem, of course, is that the right to life does not guarantee a right not to die, whatever the cost. Um, and according to the court, positive obligations under Article 2 must be inter interpreted in a way that does not impose an impossible or disproportionate burden on the authorities. Um, in the present context, I don't think any of the cases I just mentioned is really helpful. Um, since none of them really gives us any clue uh, regarding how we should decide what an acceptable risk to the right to life is or what would constitute a disproportionate burden on the authorities. Um, this is not merely a theoretical question because think for instance of the lawsuit that has been filed against the Austrian authorities for a failure to take action sooner uh, to close down ski resorts in Tyrol. Um, however, to the extent that the lawyers in this case are considering invoking the ECHR, they're probably bound to fail. And this, this is because, in my view, measures taken um, with a view to protecting public health in the context of the COVID-19 crisis, they conflict with so many different and utterly incomparable interests. And, and this kind of relates to what, uh, what Maris was saying before. Um, it conflicts, uh, lockdown measures the conflict with the protection of the social fabric, the economy, the mental health of the population. Uh, it leads to all kinds of indirect damage, including to human rights. Um, so, in my view, um, it would be unreasonable to consider that Article 2 would require the governments, for, for instance, to impose a specific type of lockdown. Um, in my view, the situation is really the textbook example of uh, the problem of incommensurability when balancing rights and interests. Um, now, in matters of healthcare policy, um, the court has always granted a wide margin of appreciation to the state to make such trade-offs. Um, and arguably, this applies with even greater force now, given the unprecedented character of the trade-offs that have to be made in this context, as well as the urgency under which authorities have to respond to the outbreak and the epistemic uncertainty regarding the development of the outbreak. Of course, if certain groups like asylum seekers would be excluded from protection, this could violate the prohibition of discrimination under Article 14. Um, but Article 2 in itself does not say anything rega regarding the required overall level of protection of public health. Um, one could also argue that the ACHR in principle uh, require specific attention for the needs of groups that may be particularly vulnerable for the coronavirus, um, either because they are more likely to be exposed to it, like health staff, or because they are more likely to get seriously ill when infected, like the elderly or people with serious underlying health conditions. Um, and at a programmatic level, the absence of any such specific attention to vulnerable groups um, might indeed be considered problematic from the viewpoint of Article 2. Um, 
However, um, to the extent that such, such specific attention has been paid to these vulnerable groups, the question then becomes, did the government do enough? Um, think for instance of the question, uh, whether, whether states have done enough to provide uh, protective equi equipment to, uh, to healthcare personnel. And here, I think again, that these are questions that uh, in principle fall within the wide, appreciation, uh, wide margin of appreciation of the government regarding the assessment of needs, setting of priorities and allocation of resources in healthcare matters. Even though I can agree uh, certainly with Donald that, uh, that these things need to be investigated and that this can be a matter under uh, the positive obligations under Article 2. Um, a separate uh, but related question is whether Article 2 can teach us anything regarding how to organize the exit from the lockdown. Um, looking at the case law, um, the medical neg negligence case law may be of some relevance. Uh, for instance, the case of uh, Lopez Assistas Fernandez, which has been mentioned before, um, in which the court has accepted that under limited conditions, Article 2 may be violated, where um, I quote, um, a systemic or structural dis dysfunction in hospital services results in a patient being deprived of access to life-saving emergency treatment um, and that the authorities knew about this or ought to have known about that risk and failed to undertake the necessary measures to, pre to prevent that risk from materializing. Um, based on this case law, one could argue that Article 2 prohibits the government from uh, loosening up restrictions too rapidly if this would knowingly expose the general population uh, to the risk of avoidable death due to an overall collapse of the healthcare system of the kind we have, for instance, witnessed in Lombardy. Um, however, um, as long as governments don't knowingly expose their population to such a risk, um, they, they have the widest margin of appreciation in making the required trade-offs, uh, even if this leads to higher mortality rates. Um, moreover, not only do I not think that positive obligations are not necessarily helpful to inform us about how to organize the exit from the lockdown, um, I think we should also be particularly careful about the kind of message invoking positive obligations in this context would send. Um, so during the process of gradually loosening the lockdown, uh, law enforcement agencies will continue to be empowered uh, to interfere in a far-reaching manner in people's day-to-day -day activities for a long period of time, um, with the encompassing risk of abuse of or the excessive use of power. And just three weeks ago, uh, here in Belgium, in Brussels, um, a 19-year-old boy, um, perhaps not coincidentally from migrant background, died when he was hit by a police car that chased him because he had run off when they tried to find him for non-compliance uh, with social distancing rules. Um, well, is this the kind of repressive law enforcement apparatus we would want to empower in the name of positive obligations um, to protect the right to life? Um, well, in this, in this regard, I fully agree with um, Natasa Marconicola, who argued in the first webinar of this series uh, that we should be particularly skeptical regarding uh, the coercive nature of any demands that positive obligations could make in this context. Um, in addition, I think we should also be careful of the risk of the rhetoric of positive obligations being invoked in a paternalist manner in the context of a lockdown exit strategy. Um, for instance, elderly people uh, may be subjected to continued far-reaching restrictions for a long period of time. Um, which may result in, in many people dying in isolation even. Um, from a human rights perspective, um, due respect must be shown to the views of the persons concerned on how they would trade off uh, their liberty against the protection of their health. Um, and in this regard, I think we should be careful not to uh, sacrifice people's agencies, uh, agency altogether in the name of positive obligations to protect their right to life. Um, now to conclude, um, at a macro level, we're confronted with the question regarding how much risk to lives we are willing to accept as a society. Um, in my view, as long as uh, lives are protected without discrimination, positive obliga obligations under the ECHR can't really help uh, in answering this question. 
So also the thing that invoking these uh, positive obligations in the context of litigation uh, would be particularly useful. Um, of course, I don't want to say that the protection of public health does not count as an important legitimate aim uh, that may justify restrictions uh, on human rights. Of course it does. Um, but I just don't think that adding a positive obligations I mentioned to justify such restrictions really adds anything to the discussion. Um, and in this context, in which we are now in all European countries confronted with far-reaching restrictions on all sorts of rights, um, I think we should better focus on scrutinizing such restrictions uh, than on providing additional justifications for them. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for those uh, very interesting and insightful comments. Um, now, we're going to be switching over to the uh, to the uh, Q&A part of the panel. Uh, I see we've already got quite a lot of questions here, but I'll be passing over to uh, my co-host, um, Constantine, if you want to take over from here to manage the Q&A and I can uh, help there as well. Um, I see we have a question from uh, Larry as well. Uh, yep. I think we have five others um, that were already preloaded. So if you want to start putting those to the panel, uh, we can get started there. Yeah, thanks very much, Stuart, and thanks very much for everybody else for for fantastic sets of uh, presentations. I see a question from Professor Larry Helfer. I will pass the floor to him in in, in a second. And also, uh, we have a couple of questions that came from chat. Uh, I will have to um, torture you a little bit by reading these questions because uh, uh, our um, those who are on YouTube, they cannot see the chat, so we'll have to read, read the questions out for you. But so before I do this uh, torturous exercise, uh, I will uh, uh, pass the floor to uh, Larry Helfer. Larry, I will unmute you now. Here we go. Please uh, ask a question. Very good. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Good morning for me. Uh, from the U.S., uh, thank you for a very interesting set of, of presentations, and uh, they intersect in some uh, very thoughtful and provocative ways. I wondered if uh, any member of the panel could speak to uh, what we are seeing in terms of government responses to the positive obligations uh, uh, in this context as set forth, for example, in the interpretive statements of the SESCR committee and the European Social Rights uh, Committee. So in particular, I'm interested in the fact that there are, to the best of my knowledge, no formal provisions for derogation in either the ICESCR or the European Social Charter. And that in turn puts more pressure on governments to raise arguments for exceptions and limitations to a positive obligation. So I'd be curious to know if the panelists have a sense of uh, what exceptions and limitations arguments governments have been raising during this emergency. Uh, we're probably too soon to know how they've been received. The reason why I raise that is one of the advantages, although it's a mixed blessing, of, uh, of uh, derogations provisions is that they do provide a, a rather immediate way for governments to signal precisely what sort of restrictions they think are necessary in response to uh, a pandemic, uh, for example. And yet, I don't know that we have any other, uh, let's call them information forcing uh, mechanisms for econ uh, economic and social rights and for, for positive obligations. So I'm wondering, uh, if the panelists have any uh, thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Larry. Uh, I will read out a couple of questions from the chat, if you don't mind, and then I will give the floor to our participants. The first question was, uh, uh, um, the first question was um, uh, regarding the following. Uh, one legal question arising under the international treaty obligation. Very few state parties have taken the step of formally notifying the Human Rights Committee of their der derogations from the ICCPR during the emergency, which is a requirement under Article 4, 
I believe uh, a handful, including some unusual suspects. Uh, is this an important step to advocate or a form uh, a formality that is uh, understandably deprioritized in this uh, crisis? I just wanted to say that we have had a whole webinar on the issue of emergencies uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, actually there is no agreement on to whether this is a required step or not. Uh, uh, I, I, I think that it is not, uh, but uh, there are quite, uh, quite a few uh, good academics like uh, Dr. Alan Green who would argue uh, in favor of making uh, derogations. And another question that I wanted to uh, read out now, and I'll pass over to the uh, panelists, uh, is uh, uh, the following. The traditional question of justiciability naturally appears in this context. Health issues uh, have been dealt with by the CHR with some difficulty. Only when the impact reaches the threshold of Article 3 or Article 2, this court uh, is willing to engage in positive obligations to provide medical care. Would the COVID-19 pandemic provide an opportunity to rethink the ECHR shortcomings on positive obligations when a health issue is at stake? I, I think that Lawrence has already mentioned something on that, uh, but uh, uh, if any of the panelists want to start, uh, please uh, let me know. I will actually unmute everyone uh, on the panel so you can just go ahead and uh, answer uh, the questions. Whoever wants to get started, please. Okay, I'm gonna do it just because my voice is louder and I can't see anyone else waving their hand. Uh, very quickly in response to this and in response to Larry's question, there is actually a derogation clause under the European Social Charter, it's Article 30. It's not massively different to what you see under the European Convention and indeed under the international provisions. As far as I know, there's been no derogations. Part of this is because I suspect this isn't the, this may not be the, the top concern of states in question, but the other thing is that many of the rights under the European Social Charter are explicitly limited or qualified or else um, are understood to be so, excuse me, in terms of uh, the committee's interpretation of those obligations. So much as I think the Human Rights Committee has said, um, you need to be very, very careful uh, in the context of the ICTPR to derogate from rights that are already limited, I think the same argument would be made in the con would be made in the context of a derogation to the European Social Charter rights. Um, and yeah, I'll just leave it there because I think that answers from my side the first two questions. Anybody else would like to add to that? I, I could I could I could chip in. I, I've I saw this question pop up, and I've uh, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I can't get away from thinking about how the Strasbourg Court is going to have to deal with the entire fallout of this. Uh, I, I know it's been covered in in, in its, its seminar. Um, the court is 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 going to have to find some type of way to uh, adequately deal with the most pressing human rights issues while at the same time doing what it always does, which is survey the lay of the land and seeing what its approach to the court is going to be in response to it. Um, I can't see, I, the, the, the case law that I, I, I touched on, particularly the, the Lopez de Sousa Fernandez in Portugal case, was a case where the court was willing to say, we haven't been clear enough previously on healthcare issues, and so we're going to take it a step, a little step further and give you a little more clarity. Um, I think it would be remiss of the court if we came out of a, 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 one of the most transformative things since the Second World War and it didn't clarify some things that were, were necessary. I think that would be hugely disappointing, but the, the reality is that the court is going to be faced with difficult questions posed from any application that comes to it for, across Europe because the, uh, the failings, the political failings uh, in the COVID-19 uh, crisis are inherently linked to human rights abuses and human rights failings as well. And so um, there will be many who will, it will be very difficult to look at this in a, in a neutral way. Um, there will be many who will use some uh, judgment from the European Court of Human Rights as, uh, uh, as a way to, to accuse the, uh, a government of failing uh, in its citizens in a particular way. And the courts, court will be conscious of that. So I, 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 uh, I think I'll be watching it with interest to see what what uh, what strategy the court adopts to deal with these these cases as they come. 
All right. Anybody else, uh, uh, Lawrence? Um, yeah. So, so I mean, I'm definitely open to the court um, kind of like opening up its its uh, its case law regarding protection uh, of health. But I would prefer that to happen in like kind of more mundane circumstances. I think here we're confronted really with uh, so many conflicting interests that it's it's very difficult. Um, for the court to, I mean, to to really come up with any with, with, with any with, with any development in this area, I think at a more I mean, it, I think developments under Articles Two, Articles Three uh, in the area of health in a more tailored manner. I mean, I'm definitely um, open for uh, I'm, I'm definitely open for that for the court to be more ambitious in that respect, but. In a way, I mean, and I think this is kind of what I what I take away also from from this conversation. Um, is I mean, it's also very interesting to because um, if we're talking about the European Convention, we're very much talking about uh, litigation and the like um, about uh, holding the states uh, accountable. Um, and I think um, in, in in court, but I think it's also interesting here, uh, as, as you can as, as you can see here in this in this webinar. That bring in these other perspectives, which may be less court-centered. Uh, I mean, they allow us to. They may be a more useful framework to, for instance, discuss matters like preparedness of healthcare services um, and the like than than like the narrow focus of, of articles two, articles three of the ECHR um, uh, do. Um, so, I mean. So maybe, I mean, maybe not all of these questions need to be answered in court. Uh, Aoife wanted to make a comment, yeah. I guess. I'm, I'm sorry to leap in again, but it's actually, uh, it's actually to feed in, it's to follow on from what Lawrence said, but also to kind of springboard off some of the comments that uh, Maris was saying. And I fully appreciate the importance of justiciability and the role of a fear of the stick of legal action um, or legal enforceability in terms of bringing about government compliance, but ultimately that only gets us so far. I think we should not be conceptualizing our understanding of human rights purely in terms of what can go to court in the here and now, largely because that would mean that we would remain where we are at the moment. Um, I'm not for a second suggesting that we are anywhere near a moment where, for instance, a UK court would be open to argumentation based on the European Social Charter in a meaningful way. We do see it referred to, in some, in, in a couple, in at least one of the austerity, um, I think one of the bedroom pa pa cases. But my key point in this situation is that actually, first of all, moving away from the UK, the European Social Charter is uh, able to be relied on in other systems. For instance, you have a decision, I think it's from last year, maybe late 2018 of the, of the Italian Constitutional Court saying that the outputs of the European Committee of Social Rights were constitutionally binding. I mean, that's, that is significant. And that has been the result of arguments being brought by lawyers and also greater awareness of the Charter in, in Italy. Um, and I think I want to go back to what I said in the beginning. If we're serious about human rights, and human rights academic research and human rights practice really having an impact for right holders, we have to look at what the problems are and we have to be imaginative in those frameworks and we have to up our game. And I want to just give a very quick example because, I, and this is certainly not you, Maris, but I want to give an example of a book that came out in 2018 with CUP on the European human rights system. In this, I think it's 200 plus books, seven pages are devoted to the European Social Charter. There is no discussion of at that point the, you know, well over a hundred uh, collective case decision, uh, collective complaint decisions. There is no engagement with, you know, the literature that's out there. There is literally a book was published with seven pages, which is underpinned by references that are so old that had they appeared in an LLM or an undergraduate dissertation, it would undoubtedly have led to a fail on that section. And I just think it's notable that when people are talking about the European European human rights system, that they feel that they can be at best so dismissive and in fact in practice so ignorant of a system that potentially is extremely important to people who are at the bottom end, bottom end, um, bottom end of societies. And again, let me be clear, I'm not talking about anyone here, but I am talking about the broader, about the broader um, issue of the lack of focus on economic and social rights, but particularly in the European context where so much work is done around the European Convention.
And I think that as academics and as lawyers, we need to push beyond them because human rights aren't just about what the courts will listen to in the here and now. It's about shaping attitudes towards human rights that will eventually lead to a cultural shift in terms of what people will argue before courts and what courts will ultimately respond to. I know Maris will come back in that. I want to very quickly as well, because there's two other questions um, bouncing off that. Uh, Cesare, I think you had a question from me about strategic litigation in the committee. I cannot answer that um, because of my position on the committee, but I would flag, and it's an interesting aspect of the, of the collective complaint system, that it's collective, it's not an individual remedy. And there's a weakness to that in that there's no individual, individual compensation as a result of the European Committee's decisions. You don't even get costs. But it does mean that the committee can look at a structural, systemic issue from that perspective, rather than having it through the lens of an individual complaint. Uh, and because I'm finishing here, I think Maria from FEANSA, you had asked a question about uh, putting people, uh, about homeless people have been put in hotels, subsequently being moved back out onto the streets following the crisis, and asking about what the retrogressive measure standard would be for that under ICESCAR. And my response to that is that that's, I wouldn't even go for retrogressive measure. That's an obligation. Uh, that is an example of the uh, obligation to respect. It's interference with existing enjoyment of the right to adequate housing. It would be the, the interference with the existing right being caused by people being turned out of hotels following, uh, following COVID-19. So that is how I would approach that problem. Uh, Marius, you wanted to say something. Oh, just very briefly. I was, I was going to say in answer, I know the question was about what the, the government response has been to um, positive obligations. But I, I must say, I have been quite astonished by the UK government's response for a, for a government that was very skeptical about um, the Human Rights Act, as we know. Um, there was this very long statement made just before Parliament went into recess uh, about how they were going to do everything in accordance with, with human rights. And that was their guiding principle. And I found that really quite astonishing. Um, secondly, in, in response to uh, Aoife, the, I, I constantly get upset, I think because we, we love our subject area, I'm constantly upset by seeing the, the lack of reference to national human rights law and the Human Rights Act. And, and at the outset of this debate on, on Twitter, you would think that we only had the ECHR and the European Court of Human Rights. And I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe mm. that there was a, this incredible reluctance to talk about what, what, what Connell's been talking about, the Smith and Ellis case, which is just right on point for, for PPE, so yeah. important. And thirdly, to be optimistic, to be, to reason for optimism is I think the Convention on the Rights of the Child litigation and jurisprudence under the Human Rights Act in the UK has been astonishing and all driven by, by Baroness Hale. And, and so you could be optimistic and say perhaps if that is sufficiently pushed, the, the charter as a, as a tool to interpret what we have in the law, we could see a similar um, similar kind of development. It, that's, I know it's been incredibly optimistic, but I think times are going to change. I think there is a, a real yeah. appetite, yeah. perhaps in the, in the modern judiciary, for something like that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Amanda, do you want to add anything to that? Um, just to come back on Larry's uh, first question, I think it was about the government's reaction to the committee's statement. As far as I'm aware, there is no reaction. Um, I just, I think that it's not even on their radar, to be honest. I think it will come further down the line when uh, we start to see the international mechanisms being used. I think that NGOs and civil society will have a big role to play. Uh, in, in mobilizing around this and I think we're you know this, the special rapporteur special procedures I think I've got about 60 plus different statements now mm -hmm. uh, around COVID-19 and I think you know as time goes on then we'll start to see things coming through the treaty monitoring and I mean the UK is not a party to the optional protocol so it's not applicable to the UK but certainly uh, other European states where we've seen very high cases, France, Italy, Spain, um, you're going to see cases coming through the optional protocol mm -hmm. by Cheska. But I think at the moment, uh, I'm not aware of anything. So, 
Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, when I was uh, listening to this conversation, I just realized that in my new book, uh, there were no references uh, neither to European Social Charter nor to uh, na national national human rights uh, uh, defense Disgusting. mechanism. Disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So, so just, like just some <laughs> retracting is in order. Absolutely. Right. So funny. <laughs> Second edition, Constantine. Yeah, Second yeah, yeah. edition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There you go. Uh, there are actually uh, three questions to uh, Kono. So uh, um, uh, two of them came directly to us, so you don't see it in the uh, general chat. So I will read them out. And uh, first question is, uh, presuming that a claim on the basis of Article 2 succeeds, how uh, somehow uh, what sort of remedies do you foresee for the claimants from the government? I, I would say that uh, the, the remedies that the CHR can uh, provide uh, are quite limited anyways. Uh, and the second question uh, in the secret questions uh, was, uh, um, could this open the floodgates to claims from various NHS staff and could this potential consequence mean that the court would be more reluctant to rule for a positive obligation under Article uh, 2. Uh, and the third question that was directed to uh, Kono, and it's from uh, uh, Cesare, um, is the following. In the last years, if not decades, the ECHR has shown a trend of deference to the emergency discourse by lowering the level of protection in presence of global crisis or uh, threats uh, such as terrorism or migration. Do you envisage the same approach by the court when dealing with uh, the standards of diligence in the area you touched upon? If yes, uh, uh, which litigation and argumentative strategies could be used to avoid excessive deference to national choices and promote accountability? So I guess, Cornell, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, th um, yeah uh, three interesting, interesting questions. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll do them in reverse, just because uh, I'd seen Cesare's question pop up. So uh, it um, it kind of leads on from from what I was I was um, my last response on was, which was about first of all, we need to to decipher the the kind of playing field with which the court is going to be dealing with whenever it comes out of this. The, the, the rise in populism, the Strasbourg bashing that we've seen for the past 10 years may not have totally gone away. And so it may be looking at this from a, a, a fairly sensitive situation, as well as, as, uh, as uh, I, think, I think Lawrence has, has made some really, really good arguments as to why positive obligations may not, <laughs> and, and it, why a court may not want to um, get too deep into them. In respect of um, uh, how you would argue it, I think it's a question of what you want to obtain from it, uh, and so this will link into the uh, to, to the question to the, the, the other um, two um, uh, uh, two colleagues have asked. First, if you if you're going down the route of actually actually trying to establish a positive obligation on the state to provide protective equipment, my my argument would be get it as far away from government policy as possible get it as far away from being able to blame a politician for a failing and put it structural, put it systemic, put it in government control. The one case, and I'm, I'm glad Maris took us back to it, the one case that actually succeeded to a degree in the UK in relation to um, failings, uh, a failure to equip soldiers wasn't actually a failure to equip them. It was a failure to issue, uh, it was a failure uh, uh, which was systemic within the army to enforce an order and the order had required um, uh, military patrols to bring uh, Iridium satellite phones with them when they went out on patrol. Um, everybody had these phones but the soldiers just did not, they didn't follow the order, persistently didn't follow the order and so in, um, the, uh, in the Court of Appeal in the ca this case it was a uh, long um, the, the court said, well, that, that, that is outside of government policy. That wasn't anything to do with political decision making. And it wasn't a, 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 an, a single failing which took place by one officer on the ground. It was a systematic failing which fell into this very, very neutral area, a very vanilla failing, 
And I think that's if you're if you're going to if you're going to get success, I think that success is going to come from something very niche like that. That being said, and, and this perhaps speaks to the remedies question for the other one. Um, the, 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 it, is, it is going to be very difficult, I imagine, for anybody to win a case to establish the positive obligation on this. And, and I think Eve has made a very good argument as to, to why we should probably be looking elsewhere if we want to make corrective systems on this basis. Where they will succeed, I think, is the investigative obligation. And so if I, if I was a government lawyer at the minute, I would be mm -hmm. saying, forget about the substantive component. We need to get these investigations so tight that nobody can ever come back at us and say that we failed in the investigations. The European Court of Human Rights has been far more willing to find states in violation of their investigative component than the substantive component. If we look at the cases emerging from Iraq, uh, the two in particular, which, which I, I've spent a lot of time looking at, al Skyni against the UK and Jalou versus the Netherlands, they, they were investigative failings by the state because they, they didn't investigate deaths properly. And I think we, we all agree, it, it probably was quite difficult to have Article 2 compliant investigations in, in a post-conflict situation in Iraq, but the European Court of Human Rights was willing to apply a standard that saw um, European states fail. And so, leading on from, from, from that, just, sorry, I, hope, I hope that answered your, your question. L leading on from that into the issue of remedies, my understanding, and, and, and this is something I, I hope I have right, is that the government has already said that it's going to offer, I, uh, Maris is nodding, I think it's £60,000. Yeah, um, it's £60,000 for the families of NHS workers who have died, but they're not extending that to anyone else at the moment. And, and, so, and so this is, I mean, this is where the, the remedies would have to be broader, but I, I think between the compensation and, uh, and uh, an investigative claim, that may be what we're, where um, most, most of these remedies are going to be, f are, are, are going to land as opposed to anything, um, uh, anything larger. How the investigations proceed is going to be really interesting. Uh, anybody who's followed the, the evolution of this, even in the past week, it suggests that coroners are not going to be able to ask any questions that relate to the policy at all. And so my assumption is that this is all going to land in what, what's already been described as the mother of all public inquiries. Um, yes. uh, and that's going to, I mean, the UK doesn't do public inquiries for tragic events like this particularly well. Um, uh, but, um, uh, uh, but uh, one of the reasons why I think a public inquiry might be what, what's absolutely needed here is there, there are so many threads to the PPE issue in particular. Um, who is actually in control of the supply chain is a massive question because there are pockets of the supply chain that look like they're controlled by the government and pockets which are still out there with different elements of the private sector. Um, some of the people who are creating uh, personal protective equipment are, um, are uh, traditional PPE um, manufacturers. Then you have um, uh, uh, clothing brands which have rebranded and taken up the charge using 3D printers. Then you have uh, high schools where technology departments are doing it. There are too many questions to be asked in, in, in isolated inquests which aren't going to engage with government policy. And so this is where I think Article 2 could really come to life. Um, uh, but uh, it's not going to answer, um, uh, not, not going to answer um, all the questions. As a result, the, the, this leads on to the last question, the question of opening the floodgates. And, and yes, that, that, that is the... That's going to be the concern. The NHS is something like the it's something like the sixth largest employer in the world, somewhere somewhere in that region. You think of the number of people who are going to have put themselves face to face contact where they perhaps could have been um, uh, uh, requiring PPE. It will be in the, the tens, if not hundreds of thousands. Um, it's it, it makes it difficult to f see a way where any court is going to want to say, yes, you absolutely always have to provide PPE. And that's me talking from NHS. I'm not, I'm, I haven't even moved on to, um, I mean, uh, dentists working in critical care centers or uh, care workers who seem to have been uh, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly for many of us, but forgotten about entirely in this uh, until, um, until recent weeks. So, thanks, uh, very, thanks, thanks very much, Connell. Uh, does anybody want to 
comments on can it? Can I chip in if that's all right? Yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, so so I've just I, I've actually just done some um, some evidence to the JCHR on the uh, procedural obligation, and I completely agree with Connell's point that um, in terms of uh, the the procedural obligation violations are going to come thick and fast after this. I mean, they're going to be really problematic, and it seems as though they're already kind of going in train. We're not going to have coroners investigating individual deaths. The lack of testing is going to lead to inadequate evidence gathering. Uh, we're going to have loads of problems in terms of follow-up as well. If coroners aren't investigating, they don't do the follow-up reports where you know they send advice uh, on how to prevent the deaths in future. Um, and that could actually lead to uh, violations in the future um, of not only the procedural obligation, but also of the obligation to protect uh, the positive obligation under Article 2 that we would see too. Um, I think uh, just in terms of the, the, the point that Cullen was making about the um, the uh, in between the middle ground that's often referred to in, in, in Smith and cases like Long, I think uh, in this specific context, one thing that might kind of bubble to the surface would be the downgrading of PPE requirements within hospitals. That seems to be a good candidate uh, for that kind of um, litigation, but I think it's going to be a, a difficult one to pin down as, as he um, quite accurately uh, notices, but expect an absolute ton mm -hmm of procedural violation obligations over the next uh, years, weeks, months, everything. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, uh, there is another question uh, in the chat, and this will be the last question, if you don't mind, because we are uh, running over time. Um, the question is about uh, uh, mental health uh, patients and uh, impacts of COVID-19 on their uh, well-being. Uh, I'm not going to uh, read the whole question, but if anyone wants to comment on this question from Fiona Anderson, uh, please. I, I think Fiona's left the call, actually. All right, OK. So you think Sorry, I had left the event. Yeah. OK. If so, I'm not, but that doesn't prevent us to comment on this question. But uh, if nobody wants to uh, say anything on that. It's just another illustration of the, all the rights conflicting. And I'm glad, Lawrence, you said incommensurable, because I actually wrote that down in something I wrote, and then I took it out because I thought, nobody says that anymore. <laughs> but it's, it, it is. It, it's just the classic example. There's so many rights positive obligations and discrimination and, and different kinds of rights that it, it's almost impossible to, for anyone to sit down and say, where does the balance lie? There's the obvious, but this situation is, is one of those where the, the impact on those with mental health um, concerns and, and, and illnesses is, is terrible. The lockdown is terrible. People are committing suicide and um, it, it's, it's, it's really difficult to get that balance right to, to say perhaps the measures need to be modified a little more, but then we don't want another resurgence of the virus. And, you know, where does the balance lie? Is, is human rights the best? I was, I was going to ask you, Lawrence, if you say that litigation is or is not the best answer or using a human rights law framework is not the answer, what, what is the answer? What, how do we how do we answer the question then? Because I, I find human rights law quite useful, or human rights obligations quite useful to think about it. Yeah, I don't know if Lawrence wants to answer this question. I would. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, I just don't, I'm not sure whether the whether the law can can I mean whether the law can really help us in this regard. But I mean, we not as not societies we can we. As societies, I think people can agree to disagree on what what kind of risks they are prepared to to run in this regard, and, and what price they are willing to pay for that. And I mean, I'm not sure whether we need to put legal limitations on that, but we can certainly. I mean, I would certainly be in favor of a of a lighter lockdown than what we see here. But then, I mean. Uh, I'm not an expert in, on, 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 on what this would lead to. So um, I think this is just, I mean, I'm not saying uh, because, I mean, what I mean is, I think is this is really an area in which 
there is room for deference in the sense that, I mean, we as lawyers may not necessarily know what the best, what a better way um, is to deal with these with this questions than, than the government does. It doesn't necessarily mean that the government knows what the best way to do it. Um, I mean, I'm quite skeptical on that question, but yeah, should we kind of overrule government on that? On what grounds? I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, this is this. There are plenty of difficult dilemmas in in this respect, indeed. And uh, when Ifa was talking about uh, the fact that uh, those people who are placed temporarily in hotels uh, shouldn't be uh, pushed away from these hotels, well, the dilemma obviously would be: what about private property? And if these hotels are private property, whether the state should protect it or not? So. There are plenty of uh, dilemmas like this mm. uh, in in every single uh, issue regarding positive obligation, and the state uh, has to uh, make really difficult choices. And I'm hoping that they are making these choices bona fide, at least, like in good faith, and trying to uh, be as neutral and uh, as effective as possible. On that note, unless there are any, anyone wants to say anything else on this point, I would like to thank everyone who stayed until this uh, uh, moment with us. I would like to sincerely thank the panelists for amazing presentations. I would like to thank Stuart for uh, chairing the, this event. And I'm hoping that this will be not the last webinar that uh, we organize and we invite you. Thank you very much and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Constantine. Thank you.